Hello, welcome back to For the Girls, your new place for everything F1. I'm Sarah. I'm Tiggy. And I'm Chessa. Today we are bringing you a 101 primer of all of the basics of Formula One in case you're new to the sport or just want a little refresher as this season starts to really pick up. Even if you can already spend 10 minutes debating whether or not DRS should exist, this episode is still a good overview of multiple aspects of F1. And fear not, we have some more advanced technical type episodes in the works. This is definitely a good episode to send your friends who you've been trying to convince to get on board the F1 hype train. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at F1RTheGirls. So let's get into it. Okay, so starting at the most basic level, what is F1? So Formula One is a series of races, or they're called Grand Prix, held at different tracks and venues called circuits throughout the world. Um, It's the pinnacle of motorsport. It's the fastest. It's the most challenging, and it leaves a lot of room for big drama and even bigger personalities, as you guys have heard us talk about lots already. Um, There are 23 races this season across North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia, with rumors of a race being added in Africa as well. So could be on every continent soon. Okay, so why should you care? Obviously, we're a little bit biased here, but we think it's one of the most exciting sports out there. We're we're looking at drivers racing over 200 miles an hour, um, and obviously the added plus of European men being super dramatic, so what's not to love? There's also insane locations that just serve as really stunning backdrops for these races, like Monaco, Miami, Vegas, Singapore, Mexico City, Brazil, and that's literally just a sampling. Like Tiki said, there's so many races. And the cool thing, too, is... There's only 10 teams, so there's 20 drivers, and there's not like a lot of turnover compared to other sports, so you really get to know the teams and the drivers. And then I think probably one of the more like alluring parts of Formula One is the big names like Mercedes, Ferrari, and Aston Martin. And then you couple that with the drivers in all of these locations, and you have a pretty luxurious and expensive sport. Like I think the team's budgets are over well over $100 million this year. So how the season works, it runs from March to December. So it's much longer than a lot of other sports seasons. And there's races either every week or every other week with an August break, and Grand Prix are on Sundays. So quickly, uh, we'll get more into this, but what happens in a race? The race is for about an hour and a half to two hours doing laps around the circuit. But for any Americans we have listening, this is not NASCAR, if that's what you think of when you think of car racing. So they aren't driving in ovals or circular tracks. Instead, these circuits can have 90 degree turns, be super twisty or narrow. Um, On top of that, some circuits are located outside of cities and kind of look more like classic racetracks. But some of them are what are called street circuits, and the cars literally race through the downtown of a city going through tunnels, past skyscrapers, and all of that. So it's super, super thrilling. So um, so Monaco is a great example of a street circuit. Um, so for all of the Formula One junkies out there, I think – the street circuits and the city races aren't as exciting because there's just not as much drama. There's less that you're able to do on a street circuit. But for example, like Monaco, you can see all of the yachts like lined up and basically like all these people and all of their yachts and apartments overlooking the city. It's it's really cool. And a hilarious story about the yachts in Monaco. So in 2006, uh, Kimi Raikkonen, who was a driver, uh, retired from the race because his car went on fire and he was just super angry. So walks off the track and instead of going back to the pits to meet his team like he was supposed to he literally there's footage of him going straight to his yacht walking on still wearing (laughs) his helmet the announcers were like he's taken off his shirt he's with some of his best mates from finland who've consumed their own weight in champagne and beer and he's just like sitting there shirtless while the race is still going on but it's so epic he won the championship with ferrari the year after so i guess you know All's well that ends well. He's a legend. (laughs) And in terms of some other street circuits that are so fun, um, in Singapore and in Azerbaijan and Baku, which is one of my favorite circuits, there are people who could literally sit in their offices or their hotels, their apartment buildings and watch the race. It's that close, which is also (laughs) what 
um, Vegas is going to be like. Yeah, guys, this is not the this is not the Macy's Day Parade where you can sit in your office on Fifth Ave and watch the race. Like, this would be enough to get me to take a job. I don't know about you guys, but hundred percent. <laughs> so some more basics. How do you win? The podium is like anything else. It's top three, um, but there are still points if you finish off the podium. There are po- there are points for every race. Twenty five points for a win, down to one point for tenth place, and then no points for finishing ten through twentieth or not finishing at all. And when you add up all the points for each driver, that culminates in the driver's championship. Add up all the points for the two cars per team, that's the constructor's championship. So you guys will hear us talking about both of those throughout the season. Um, And just one quick note, the order that you guys will hear often, P1, P2, etc., this literally just means the place someone is at in the race or the place they finish. So you could say, oh, Checo's in P3 right now, so he's driving in position three, or Charles finished P1, like he finished first. And so, like I said before, there's 10 teams. Each team has two drivers, but then teams can also have backup or reserve drivers as well. The teams go like this, Mercedes, Red Bull Racing, Ferrari, McLaren, Alpine, Alpha Tauri, Aston Martin, Alpha Romeo, Haas, and Williams. So many A's. It's so hard to keep track, but we got you guys. <laughs> and also, according to the rules, you can have a maximum of 26 cars allow, allowed to compete that would, in theory, equate to 13 teams. But as we've talked about, there's a massive like monetary barrier to entry to get into F1 in the first place. So that's why we only see 10 teams right now. But We mentioned this last week, but it would be super fun if we could get some extra teams and just expand the sport altogether. Yeah, there's a bit of drama right now about kind of new manufacturers or potentially new teams trying to enter the sport. So definitely stay tuned on that front. So a quick overview of who the really big players are. Mercedes have absolutely dominated Formula One ever since the start of the turbo hybrid era in 2014, which is the year the previous generation of new engines were introduced They have won the Constructors' Championship for the past eight years in a row. And on top of that, they have the highest win percentage of any team at almost 50%. They've won 124 out of 252 races. So that is just an insane stat. Complete dominance up until last year slash this year. But up until then, just truly no one, no one even came close. And Lewis Hamilton is probably like the the big draw here. He's the British Mercedes driver. We talked about him a lot. I have a love-hate relationship uh, with him, but he's one of the best drivers of all time. He's the most mainstream celebrity, like we're talking Met Gala famous. But he's won the seven, he's won seven drivers' championships. So he's tied with Michael Schumacher for the most of all time. He's won 82 out of Mercedes 124 races. So basically carried the team on his back. I think a good American sports comparison for our Americans out there is Lewis Hamilton is like Tom Brady. Just just so dominant that people kind of want to root against him, but you really can't argue with how dominant he is. Sarah, all the American football fans are like quaking in their boots right now that you just compared Tom Brady to Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> he is also, we talk about this a lot, very, very classy, like on and off the track, mostly off the track, but always has really great things to say. Is also very like politically and socially plugged in. And so it's just a really good platform for Formula One and the sport in general. Besides Mercedes, we also have Red Bull. They're another top team and they've been chasing Mercedes for years. And finally, they have caught up. They're a relatively newer team. They've only been racing since 2005. Um, And a driver we talk all the time about, Max Verstappen, he is a Red Bull driver and the 2021 world champion. He is definitely, he's one of the big young talents in the sport. There was a lot of bitter sort of Max Lewis and Red Bull Mercedes rivalry last season. Um, but Lewis and Max both earn about $50 million a year. So you guys can just quiet down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we have Ferrari as well. This is like the classic famous Italian team. And I also think, fun fact, red is such an important color in sports and Ferrari obviously is red and I think Formula One, people equate Ferrari a lot with Formula One just because of that color comparison. Um but that's this is the oldest team in the sport. They've raced every year since 1950, and they have the most wins of any team. 
And if you've listened to any of our three last three podcasts, you know they're making a big comeback this year after a few under the weather years. Charles Leclerc, he's their he's their driver, the leader of the season so far. Another super young, talented driver. In terms of other teams, McLaren is also a team that has won world championships and really been on top in the past, but they've struggled recently and are trying to make it back to the top. Um, they're right after Ferrari in second place with the most historical wins, but definitely have been towards more towards the midfield in recent years. Daniel Ricardo is also um, important to mention. He's an Australian racing for McLaren. He's one of the most famous drivers in the United States because people really love him from Drive to Survive. He also loves America, so it's a, a mutual love. He has a house and in we LA. Love him. Yes. <laughs> and we love him. Yes. <laughs> as everyone saw, he buys into Texas so much for – the United States Grand Prix. He is absolutely obsessed with Texas. I love a resident hype man. I think every sport needs to have one. And I just think like that unabashed goofiness that he brings. Um, I get you. I bet you some people that really love Formula One or like old, old timers kind of stick their nose up at it. But I think it's so important just as the sport starts to grow and attract more people. He's a big asset. A hundred percent. And so most drivers are in their 20s, a few are in their 30s, but the ones in their later 30s are all former world champions. Two other drivers to mention, Sebastian Vettel and Fernando Alonso aren't in great cars anymore. Vettel's with Aston Martin and Alonso's with Alpine, but they are previous world champions and are amazing drivers. So they're definitely people to look out for more in kind of the midfield pack. Yeah. And we talk a lot about the drivers, but every Formula One team employs from hundreds up to over a thousand people. You know, they, they're they just a machine and there are so many people behind the scenes that don't get as much airtime, obviously, as the drivers, but who else is on the team? So we obviously have the two drivers. They're teammates, but they're also competitors, which makes for a super fun dynamic because your teammate is the only one with the same car. And so really the person you're competing against to show that you're better with the same raw materials but teammates also have to work together for the constructors championship so you do want your teammate to do well but not better than you very fine line to walk (laughs) yeah for sure and we've talked a lot about that with like charles and carlos and you know lewis and botas and max and checo in the past but yeah it's a very interesting dynamic besides the drivers we also have the principal it's sort of like the head coach Um, some principals are also the ceos but Some teams have separate CEOs. The big ones to look out for here, Mercedes, we have Toto Wolf, who we all love um, and respect. He, an interesting dynamic is he owns a third of Mercedes. So he's got a huge financial stake, which is not the same as a lot of the the principals in F1. Christian Horner for Red Bull and Mattia Binotto for Ferrari as well. I didn't know that Toto owned a third of his team. Yeah. That's that's an interesting dynamic. And I feel like Maybe that's why he gets so impassioned in the in the pits. Like it's why he's like throwing his shit everywhere when I would. isn't doing well. <laughs> it's like literally watching the market crash. <laughs> so besides principles, we have the race engineer person who's like on the radio with each of the drivers, telling them strategy, car data, kind of giving them other inputs that they would need to be able to drive their car to the best capacity. And one part that really fascinates me is this traveling team. So Tiggy said at the beginning, you know, there's like a factory, thousands of people working back at home for the car, but there's around 75 to 100 people who travel to each race. So engineers, mechanics, the pit, the pit stop crew, obviously, and a bunch of other people, like even PR people. Some drivers even have like performance coaches. Lewis has that one woman that follows him around everywhere. Angela, yes. What does she do? She is, a lot of drivers have a performance coach, which kind of seems like for some drivers, it's part personal trainer, but also part kind of like life coach slash friend. (laughs) Yeah. Slash friend since they're together for however many, the vast majority of the year on the road, like over well over 200 nights on the road. Anyway. So besides Angela, there are some teams that have other people, like I said, the factory team. So everyone who's working at home base, this is like a full company, you guys, it's engineers, data scientists, people running the simulator, like the whole business, everything. And then of course, Formula One's all about the money. So you got to have the investors, the title sponsors, the partners, they're the ones really driving the whole team. Besides all of those people, F1 is governed by the FIA. Um, and so basically all the cars in Formula One look very similar because the FIA has really strict rules about how the cars are designed and constructed and all the different rules and how all of the races go. That's the kind of like the formula behind Formula One. Let's get into how a race weekend actually works. A Grand Prix is usually held over three days from Friday to Sunday. So on 
Thursday, um, the teams will arrive and set up. They might arrive earlier in the week if it's a really far away race like Australia, but oftentimes get there on Thursday. The paddock refers to to the area where all the teams set up. And then on Thursday, the teams will also do track walks to examine the circuit and some of those track characteristics. So Friday morning, there's driver press conferences. These are really fun. They're way more spicy than press conferences in American sports, which I think tend to be really dry. These press conferences, people will go after each other. Usually FP1 and 2 are on Friday and FP3 is on Saturday. This stands for free practice session. So it's literally just a fancy abbreviation to say practice. They last one hour each and they're super important because they're a time for the drivers to familiarize themselves with the track, experiment with different car setups, try out tires, and really just fine tune the cars. How much track time the teams get during the season is very tightly regulated. They don't just get to practice whenever they want. So these three hours are really key for the team. I think that's a really good point, Sarah, because in a lot of sports, people practice, like teams can practice hours and hours, like perfecting their plays. But I think in Formula One, because of all of these regulations, like people have to get really creative off of the uh, off of the circuit so obviously like workouts and personal training and coaching is super important but that's why you see drivers a lot of the times like using their simulators and having really fine-tuned simulators because that's the only way that they can kind of on their own time perfect their skills yeah so the simulators back at the factories will be incredibly detailed and give sort of as much of a real on-track experience as is possible, given that it's a simulator and the simulators can imitate all these different tracks. So Chess, that's 100% true. They really do have to get creative, given that the actual time that the car is on the track is so restricted. Then we get into quali. So after practices, usually on Saturday afternoons, qualifying determines the grid. So this is where it really counts. You obviously want to do well in practice, but qualifying is determining the order in which the cars will race on Sunday. And this is based on the time it takes drivers to do one lap as fast as they can, called a fast lap or a flying lap. And the cars line up two side by side for 10 rows to start the race. So doing well in quali so you can start at the front is really, really important. And throughout qualifying, there are three phases. You'll hear Q1, Q2, Q3. So for Q1, all 20 cars go out. The five slowest cars are then eliminated and will take grid positions 16 through 20, depending on their lap time. Then Q2, the 15 cars that made the cut repeat this again. And then again, the slowest five cars get cut. And then Q3, that decides the grid position for the top 10 cars. So in Q3, cars will battle for pole position. This is the car that sets the fastest lap time and gets to start first in the race. So when someone says Charles got pole or is starting on pole, that's what they mean. He's starting first. Um, Q3 is only 12 minutes long, so it's not like they really have all day to set a fast lap. So there's also some strategy there and when to send people out, when to do a flying lap, all of that. I think Q3 is the best 12 minutes of the whole race weekend. (laughs) You guys can quote me on that. Wow, yeah, that's that's for sure a hot take, but it is really exciting. (laughs) And it's really fun to see cars flat out, not in race conditions, usually having kind of a more open track and being able to just really push the car to the limit to set these fast lap times. Three races this season are going to have a sprint race format instead of the traditional qualifying that Tiggy just talked about. So forget everything she said. This is a little bit different. (laughs) It's basically a shorter mini race on Saturday to determine the grid on Sunday. So traditional qualifying will actually get moved to Friday to then set the grid for the sprint race. Sprint race is basically a mini 25, 30 minute race that will then set the grid for the Grand Prix. The top eight finishers in the sprint get points. Um, These are super exciting. Sarah, I think this is your favorite. Like you always get so excited when this is happening and they really spice up the weekend. (laughs) Yeah, I love it. It definitely adds a bit of flair. Then it is Sunday and then it is time for the actual race. Cars will come out early for a formation lap and then they'll line up on the grid according to their quality positions. So if you see the cars zigzagging, on the formation lap and kind of swerving. That's to try to warm up their tires before the race starts. So then all the cars are stopped in rows of two each. Then the way they start is five lights go on and all click off. And the announcers say, lights out and away we go. And the yeah, announcers- Sarah, Sarah, you can say it better. Like, how do you say it when they when you're like in the ready to race? It's so the exciting The announcers for you. are like, <laughs> lights out and away we go. Like the announcers are so excited. And for the first, the first lap, the announcers are just all screaming. The it's amazing. Time. 
we low key get chills every time they say that. Don't judge us, but it's <laughs> it's so magical. And we're always watching these races together, usually very early on Sunday mornings a lot of the time. Um, so it's a great way to wake you up out of your Saturday night haze for sure. Oh yeah, we should have said this before. So if you are in the US because of the time differences, a lot of the races are early morning on Sunday US time, at least Eastern Standard Time because we're in New York. Um, so usually between like 9 and 11 a.m. So yeah, you gotta be gotta be up and at it if you're trying to watch it live. <laughs> First lap of the race is always so exciting because it helps establish the order for the rest of the race. Turn one is usually super dramatic. Then the cars are off and racing. So Obviously, the main goal is to pass or what's referred to as overtaking other cars to get to the front. The straights refer to just exactly what they sound like, the straight part of the track where drivers can often get over 200 miles an hour. And then there's turns and chicanes, which is a tight sequence of corners going in opposite directions. Some turns are super tight and are much slower, where some turns are really more high-speed corners where there is a ton of G-force for the drivers. And that's where you tend to see a lot of the action. I mean, you, you get overtaking a lot on the straights, but in the corners, that's where, that's where a lot of stuff goes down. Um, We've talked a lot over the past couple episodes about pit stops and the strategy around that, but sort of at the most basic level, box or pit refers to a pit stop, which is when the drivers pull into the pit lane and make a stop and the pit crew changes the tires very fast. It can be usually under three seconds, aiming for the fastest pit stop possible. And it's usually one to two pit stops per race and you have to make at least one stop. And like we mentioned, there's a whole strategy around that. Tires degrade as they're used. So if you have fresher tires, you go faster. But the trade-off is that you lose a lot of time making a pit stop. And just a quick note about the tires. So we've talked about soft, medium, or hard tires. And Pirelli is the official supplier of them. And teams get a set of tires each race weekend. And it's up to them to sort of build a strategy around when they want to use them and how. So the soft tire, fastest tire, but degrades the fastest. Hard tires last the longest, but they're also harder to heat up and not as grippy as the soft or medium tires. Oh, and also there's two tires for when it's raining or the track gets wet. So those are the ones that you don't hear about as often. Um, okay, so what are the rules of Formula One? You're not just driving around on a circuit, you guys. There's there's things going on. So as you can imagine, you obviously cannot cause a crash. You can't push another car off the track or gain an advantage from like driving off the track and then getting back on it. Um, you also can't weave around to prevent someone from passing you. So kind of what Stroll was doing last weekend. What but. Chessa referred to last <laughs> episode as the boy slash girl code of Formula One. <laughs> yeah, you just can't break the girl code. If there is a rule violation, people will call the stewards to investigate it. The stewards work for the FIA. Um, and then there's two race directors who are ultimately in charge. So stewards, are they work for the FIA. They're like the referees in American sports. The penalty can be a time penalty, a grid drop for the next race, et cetera. And two things here. One, a lot of times the penalties, like the time penalties, the penalties will get implemented in the race. So the, the team will call the driver and be like, okay, you have to serve your penalty now, like in the pit stop, or you got to let someone pass. So it's all happening real time. And what's super interesting is that you used to be able to listen in on the team principals calling the stewards. I think the most famous example of this when last year Toto called Michael, who was he was the Michael Massey was the race director last year, who has since been fired for various reasons. <laughs> <laughs> well, because basically, what happened for those that didn't listen, like Toto would get on, be like Michael, this is so not right, and then <laughs> it would be like this whole back and forth evolving in front of the entire world, and we would all be able to see all of this and. It's just really hard because you can definitely have like a certain amount of sway on the race directors. So there's obviously a lot of um, contention around that. And so they changed the rule for that this year where they're no longer broadcasting the audio. And so I think that's good because it at least creates for sure a perception problem when you can hear live while you're watching the race, all the team principals yelling at the people who are essentially the referees. So I think that was kind of a good change. What happens if there is an incident or something happens? So if a driver crashes or there's debris on track or it's like a torrential downpour and the track's too wet to drive safely, if it's a really bad situation, then we get a red flag. So this totally stops the race and the cars come back into the pits and just park and chill there while the track gets cleaned up. If it's not as bad, there's a safety car. So this is when a car pulls out in front of the drivers and forces them to keep a slower pace to stay behind the car. Drivers have to stay behind the safety car and can't pass other drivers. Safety cars really throw a big wrench into race strategy because all the cars bunch up. So 
all the cars lose their lead to the car behind them and the restart can be really chaotic. And since everyone's driving more slowly, you lose a lot less time making a pit stop. So you lose less places. So this also kind of throws a big wrench into teams pit stop strategies. Then if there's kind of a more minor incident, there can be a double yellow flag or a virtual safety car, which called the VSC requires the drivers to slow down and not overtake. So you want to tell us a little bit about strategy and the the basics of race strategy? Yeah, a couple things on this. So first, we've talked about DRS in our previous episodes, but DRS, drag reduction system, it's used by the car behind to make it easier for them to overtake the car in front. So this is only allowed to be used in specified DRS zones on the track. And if you're within one second behind a car when you reach a DRS detection point, then it's enabled. So again, yeah, DRS, it allows the flap on the rear wing of the car to open, which as it sounds like reduces drag and makes the car that's trying to overtake go 10 to 12 kilometers or six to seven miles per hour faster than the car in front of it. And then one more thing just around strategy. So undercut is a term you'll probably hear a decent amount watching F1. So an undercut is pitting earlier than the car in front of you so that you get fresher tires and can hopefully go fast enough on your out lap, your first lap out of the pits, that by the time your competitor comes to pit, they come out behind you. So you basically jump a place by pitting earlier and going faster. Commentators have been saying that the undercut may be more powerful this season because the tires are taking longer to heat up, but we'll see how that plays out. Okay, so what happens at the end of the race? Basically, the top three drivers just go up on the podium and spray champagne Uh, The best part of the weekend is sometimes they add a camera to the champagne bottle and you can see them spraying. Sometimes it's very exciting if it's like an exciting win, but a lot of the time I feel like Lewis and Max, when they're out there, just like, eh, we're done with the champagne. Let's move on. (laughs) And they're like half-heartedly spraying the champagne. (laughs) When you've done it a hundred times, I feel like you probably get pretty tired of it. Okay. So after the champagne showers, the teams basically just pack up and pretty quickly move to the next location. Now that we've given you guys a quick overview of the teams, the season, what a race weekend looks like, we thought we'd give you a little teaser of some advanced content. And then if you guys like this level of analysis, we'll do a big deep dive. So we'll give you a quick little thing, some quick little facts about the cars. The reason the cars are so important is because, like we said earlier, there's kind of a formula to Formula One. So there's small components of the, of the cars that the teams have control over. And that really is um, why they're always like fine tuning the cars for each part of the race. And there's a lot that goes into it. But overall, the car design is aerodynamic, aerodynamically designed to provide the least resistance as the cars cut through the air. So they need speed, they need grip on the track, they need fuel efficiency to finish the race. And because of this really awesome aerodynamic design, F1 cars are actually faster than airplanes when they take off. So that's over 200 miles an hour. So the reason that Formula Ones don't in fact fly like planes <laughs> It's basically because they have wings and diffusers on the car that provide negative lift or basically like a downforce that presses the car down on the track, which I think is really cool. And then another thing about just the sheer magnitude of these cars and this sport, the drivers are insane. Like major props to them. It takes a huge amount of energy to drive these cars. So drivers will experience a force of 2G when they're accelerating and up to 6G on fast corners. So G-force is the force that the driver will experience. And basically what that means is they're being like 2G means that the driver is being pulled by a force equal to two times their weight. So when they're going on a turn, their neck is being pulled in the other direction at six times their weight. It's it's pretty awesome. It's insane. And for anyone who thinks that, you know, I mean, what Chessa just said refutes this, but anyone who thinks that they're just like sort of casually driving cars around a track, even if it's super fast, when you see them get out of their cars, they are dripping in sweat. They lose multiple pounds every single race for how hard they are working, how much force is on them. It is it is pretty crazy. They're super, super in shape. <laughs> and so this is why if you ever see videos of F1 drivers training, they do these super crazy looking neck exercises where they're basically lifting weights with their neck because they have to be able to sustain so much force just to be able to keep their head upright. So it definitely is not as as Chessa was saying, not just people sitting in cars and driving them around. So thanks for joining us for this bit of a 101. Um, DM us if you're interested in us doing kind of a part two deeper dive into all of this. And thanks for tuning in. 